Okay, so good afternoon. Um, welcome to Hybrid Cloud, the HIPAA compliant enterprise with Kubernetes. So today we're gonna talk about how a, uh, a large healthcare provider in Southwest Pennsylvania manages their HIPAA compliance um, on on-prem systems in the cloud. Um, and we'll learn a little bit, little bit of our journey along the way of, of how we went from, you know, from our on-prem systems to the cloud. So um, if you've noticed my swag, I work for Heptio now, but when I wrote this talk, I actually worked for uh, UPMC. So from this point on, I'll be a UPMC employee until the last slide. Um, so at UPMC, I was a software architect. Um, I was responsible for bringing containers and Kubernetes to UPMC and UPMC enterprises. Um, so there, my job was to help move applications from um, developers' workstations to the cloud. Um, and do that in a HIPAA compliant way. Um, I've done a lot of open source, and you'll see that throughout this talk. Um, and if you check out our enterprises GitHub repo, you'll see lots of things that we've written. Um, so who is UPMC? Well, they're the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So they're a $16 billion enterprise, uh, 80,000 employees, more than 30 hospitals, 3.2 million member health plan, as well as some other stuff. And the other stuff is where UPMC Enterprises comes into play. So UPMC Enterprises is outside of UPMC, um, and their job is to create revenue streams for the hospital. So we do that in a number of ways. One is to write software and then commercialize it. Uh, we'll also write software, spin a company off of that and have that company be successful, or we'll help invest in companies and, and do the same kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of where I work. That was my job, doing R&D kind of work and, and you know, sort of more things out front in front of the, uh, the traditional hospital sense. So a lot of those applications needed to access clinical data. And if you think of an enterprise with 80,000 employees, there's lots of systems. Uh, but when you think of clinical data in a healthcare environment, you get a picture like this. Um, so this slide is about a year old, but there's over 1,000 different applications within UPMC that has varying data sources. So things from um, you know, electronic health record systems to radiology to um, just you know, the lab, work, lab works. It goes on and on and on. Um, data now is counted in petabytes per year. Uh, there's a big diversity in the behavior of the data the type of data that is contained within, the performance of accessing that data, as well as the access patterns of how you get to it, as well as the sensitivity. So everything from mental health status to HIV status to evidence of child abuse. You could imagine this is the most sensitive data you could, you could deal with, and we need to treat it correctly. So with that background, let's talk about what HIPAA is. So HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Now, if you've read through HIPAA, there's lots of different pieces and parts, and there's lots of white papers you can dig into. Um, so the one I want to focus on today is the piece that talks about prohibiting the disclosure or misuse of information about private individuals. So TLDR, we want to keep your patient data healthy and safe and only letting the people who should access it access it. We're talking about things like social security numbers, medical record numbers or MRNs, which are IDs within your EHR to help you find you uniquely. Uh, even your name is, is, is PHI. Uh, basically anything that can describe you specifically we want to protect, because with that data, we can go back and find out who you are uniquely. So why create HIPAA? Why make up these rules, these regulations, and these things? The idea is we want to come up with sort of standards. And I have standards in quotes because there's not a standard, um, but we want to figure out ways that we can talk about this data. So there's one way it is to have us manage our own data correctly, but then you have to think of when we move to public clouds or other places, they're managing our data now. Or if you have vendors that have feeds of your data, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. So if I have the most secure network, but my vendor is pulling data and they're weak, then, then, I'm, then I'm still having an issue with data. So, um, so we're gonna talk about some things around the standards and how this data is gonna put together. So again, if you don't wanna read through all of that, I'll summarize the main topics that we wanna cover in terms of meeting HIPAA compliance. And the first one is encryption at rest. So while data's sitting on a disk, not moving, sitting in a cache, you need to have that data be encrypted. It can't be in plain text. You need to have encryption in transit. So you're moving from point A to point B. That, that needs to be over a TLS connection, um, over whatever protocol you're gonna manage that through. We need to have auditing down to the user level. So I need to know who accessed the data, what patient they looked for, and be able to identify that specifically to that user. Um, we use a lot of service accounts in the hospital. So these accounts that just have full access to the system, um, those aren't good enough, right? Knowing that you know, service account 1234 accessed Steve Sloka's data doesn't help me in terms of auditing who looked at what data. So I um, need to have auditing down to that level. And they need to have a BAA, and this is with vendors and other places. So that's a business associate agreement. So basically a contract between you and a third party to decide how we're gonna manage this data in a, in a HIPAA compliant kind of way. Cool, so those are the kind of the rules that we're gonna focus on today in terms of meeting compliance. 
so for on-premises, um, we'll give you a, and again, I'm going to try and be open and clear about what we're doing. Um, you may see things that you could do better. Uh, it's just the reality of where we've, we've grown from our, from our, our lives of, of, of Kubernetes and everything. Um, so for our infrastructure, right now we run some Red Hat Atomic, and we're looking at moving to some CoreOS Tectonic as our um, solutions. This is all running on VMware servers within our, our corporate data centers. Um, we started our Kubernetes journey in January of 2015. Um, so then nodes were called Minions still, um, and it was still beta. So it was only six months old. It didn't GA until that, that summer. Um, so we were sort of on the bleeding edge of, of Red Hat Atomic as well as Kubernetes and then our own learning of, of how this stuff worked. Um, for storage, we use things with NFS. Um, for good or bad, and we also use local storage. Um, some applications we have may have 20 users, right? So the complexity of being cloud native and having dynamic persistent volumes and all those you know, fun topics, um, sometimes that complexity outweighs the simplicity of just running data locally to a disk for those small kind of applications. Um, so sometimes, you know, do the simplest thing to solve your problem and don't get too crazy. Um, for load balancers on-prem, we use a lot of F5. Um, so F5 can route to node ports. We're looking at doing some ingress routing as well. Um, we also do just straight node ports. So an engineer, engineer may push an application, expose it on a node port, and then um, you know, hit one of those nodes and just access it that way. In terms of workloads, we run a lot of CI, CD. So we have some rules where our, our source control systems must live on-prem. Um, so our GitLab runners and our Jenkins workers those will build images and push um, images out to Amazon, where we're actually going to run these things in production. Uh, we also have some local agents, so things like data collection and proxying, which we'll get into in a few slides. Um, those things run in our, our internal Kubernetes clusters. Um, so I have this slide is to show you that you know, on-prem is harder. Um, it's not impossible. I think the one thing that on-prem miss, misses that we're missing, at least in our environments, are a lot of APIs. So giving us a good API, you can, you can do anything, right? And that's what cloud environments typically give us. Um, you know, be able to script out machines and script out load balancers and those sort of things. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible on-prem, it's just for the infrastructure we have, those are the struggles that we ran into. Um, and that's kind of why we did this move to the cloud, um, just because it was simpler and faster for us to get, um, get things done and get things moving. And you've heard that story over and over, I'm sure. Um, so again, we're in a public cloud mode now. So our cloud infrastructure looks like this. We run everything on AWS. Uh, we have a few services on Azure for authentication to our um, backend AD systems, but mostly everything's on AWS. Uh, we run single region uh, within multiple availability zone. So we'll run in US East 1, Virginia, uh, across three zones typically. Uh, we'll run multiple worker auto-scaling groups. So an auto-scaling group is kind of like your deployment. So it says I want to have n number of these machines running, and then those reference launch configurations, which is your spec file and your deployment. Um, so that tells you, hey, I want you know, 10 machines of this type. Um, and we'll mix those up so you can have you know, a general purpose kind of machine running. Um, you can have machines with GPUs maybe, um, and maybe high memory machines. Again, so you can mix and match those, those, those environments to meet the capacity of our users. Um, everything's running on Container Linux from CoreOS, um, and it's some custom cloud formation that we've kind of pushed together. Um, to help deploy, deploy those environments. Um, again, I mentioned the CI pipelines, those push to Elastic Container Registry in AWS. We run classic ELBs and we do a lot of VPNs from, to the on-prem systems. So from on-prem to cloud VPCs, we'll create those VPNs. So here's a look at what our, our Kube cluster looks like when we deploy it to AWS. So we deploy um, following the NIST templates, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So this um, outlines basically two VPCs. So you'll see in the left you have an application VPC, and on the right there's a management, and they're peered together. So everything in the application VPC is private to the world. So there's no public ad addresses. The only ex access is via the Bastion hosts in that management VPC. Um, we'll manage those um, users on those Bastion hosts with OpsWorks. And if you're an AWS guru, that sounds funny, um, but we're using the um, ability to drop SSH keys onto those boxes. So the cool thing about OpsWorks is it'll manage SSH keys across regions. So you can have a machine in every region, I can drop an SSH key in there and it'll deploy that for me. If I kill that key, it'll re revoke that from all the machines. So now I kind of have you know, key management at the edge for free from, from AWS. Again, this is open source out on our, our GitHub for enterprises, so if you're curious about how that looks, um, feel free to dig into there. Um, this screen is going to be super hard to read, so don't try. But this shows you all of the HIPAA compliant offerings in AWS. So again, in that BAA agreement, AWS says, hey, we'll certify these things that you can use. And the idea is that we can only put PHI in a service that AWS lets us do it. And if we don't 
if they don't have it on that list, then we can't put data there. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use a service if it's not in that list. It just means you can't put PHI in it. So at one point, ElastiCache, which is like Redis for the cloud, um, was not compliant. So we couldn't use it for, for storing patient data, but we could use it for, say, you know, a phone number lookup or a zip code lookup. Um, as long as you don't put PHI in those systems, then you'll still be compliant and you won't mess that up. As long as you can manage that cleanly within your, within your environments. Um, so not everything is compliant, like you said. So typically new services aren't. So things that came out in reInvent last week, mostly those are not going to be compliant when they're new. Like EKS that came out probably won't be compliant for, for a while, um, even being it's still, in, you know, still in preview. Um, but things like, like there's a spot between an internet gateway and the ELB that's not. So if I have an on-prem system and a VPN tunnel to my VPC, that spot right there is not encrypted. So I have a full tunnel, and that little spot basically doesn't, doesn't meet my encryption and transit story. So we have systems on-prem that don't do TLS, right? They just don't do that. So if we fire those streams up to the cloud through this encrypted VPN tunnel, we're going to miss HIPAA compliance because that little spot there doesn't, doesn't meet compliance in AWS, AWS's cloud. So um, these are the kind of gotchas you have to watch out for. Um, it's not always super simple. And that's why you pull in a good solutions architect from AWS. So this is a good pump to Mike Coons. So if everyone go tweets him now and say, good job, Mike. Um, I'd appreciate it. Um, so he's been a great help from us. So he helps you. Um, you know, build out your solutions, know how new things are coming, how things can adapt. Um, he's been a great resource to help, help us manage ourselves in the cloud, because it is honestly a lot, a lot to deal with. <clears throat> so let's talk about some workloads. So things on Kubernetes we run. So we run some stateless applications, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And when you think of stateless applications, you think of they're easy peasy, right? Stateless apps was the first workload we've ever run. Um, that was my first Hello World demo on Kubernetes. You know, they're self-contained. There's no storage. There's no dependencies. Um, we can scale them with deployments. They're super simple, but um, all you have to manage there is encryption and transit, and you're pretty much sold, right? So those are easy, and we'll talk too much about those. But what gets interesting are stateful applications, right? I need to store state somewhere in my application. So how do I do that? Well, there's struggles that we run into. So things like, how do you manage persistent storage? Um, how do you resize and upgrade? So I have this application running, and I want to upgrade it and make it bigger. How do I do that? How do I reconfigure it in my templating? So I have this thing spec'd out somehow, and I, I scale it up to, to some different number of replicas. How do I store that back in my configuration so I can redeploy that easily? How do I back it up and make sure that I can restore in case of disasters? Um, well, typically, we use stateful sets for that, right? And stateful sets are kind of the story today of how we do things. But the problem is, is that they, they, um, what they do is they allow you to have persistent storage attached to a volume. And I think of the My Buddy. So if anyone from the 80s grew up in the 80s, it's My Buddy and me, right? Wherever your pod goes, your volume's going to follow. Um, and you get basically one volume per claim. And this solves one problem, right? This solves the issue of how do we manage persistent storage. So, in AWS's world, we can use EBS volumes, which are network-attached storage. And as long as I stay in the same availability zone, then that volume will follow it around, no problem. But <clears throat> the problem there is that we still have these other pieces that are missing, right? How do we resize? How do we reconfigure? How do we back it up? We haven't solved that story with stateful sets. Um, but so the answer kind of then is maybe an operator. So CoreOS kind of coined this term about a year or so ago. And basically, an operator is a tool that lets you manage application-specific knowledge um, within a complex app in, in code. So now, instead of having um, a YAML file describe your application, you have an operator. And the operator's job is to know how to do those things, how to back it up, how to scale it, how to you know, resize it. But I kind of want to simplify this and think of it this way. Let's just make it work like a cloud-provided offering, right? <clears throat> I don't care that it's an operator and that it has CRDs and it has you know, all these crazy things that are fun and interesting. As a user, all I care about is that I can deploy this and make it look like my AWS resources. Anytime I can offload work to AWS, I'm going to do that, right, because it's easy. Um, things like an RDS database, which is, you know, say, MySQL. I can tell AWS, hey, build me a MySQL database. I can check a box to scale it across zones, back it up at night, and do patches at 3 a.m., and then I'm hands off. What I want to make is these operators work the same way. I'm going to have a, a bit of YAML with my CRD to describe I want a cluster of this size, and I want to scale it across zones and have it backed up automatically. And that leads us to the Elastic Operator. 
Um, so this is an open source tool that I've written. Um, it fills the need of us needing Elasticsearch. Um, so we have a large system which is um, pulling in documents from the hospital. And then we wanted to have full text search on that system. Amazon offers Elasticsearch, but it's not HIPAA compliant. So again, we had to go build our own. So that's where this kind of got born out of. So Elastic Operator basically mimics a cloud offering. So it has full TLS, um, meaning it has automatic search generation. So if you don't provide search to it, it'll go build its own. Again, we want to have full encryption in transit. Um, for encryption at rest, we're going to use encrypted EBS volumes. So it'll create storage classes behind the scenes, and that storage classes will have that um, checkbox to encrypt the volumes. So within KMS, you'll be encrypting those EBS volumes automatically. And it implements you know, encryption in transit via search guard. Um, search guide is a tool from Floorgun. Um, so they have a commercial offering, but they have an open source version as well. Um, and that's worked really well for us over the, over the last few months. So um, it also spans availability zones. So when you deploy this, I mentioned we go across three AZs in AWS. Um, so this will make sure that it puts the data nodes and evenly is distributed across those zones. So in the case of there's a zone failure, you'll have the proper replicas in those right zones. Um, it does automatic snapshots to S3, and it deploys add-ons as well. So things like Kibana, which is a tool used to manage your data, um, or visualize your data, and there's Cerebro, which is a tool to manage um, Elastic itself. So you can get stats off of that. So again, if you look at this, this is kind of fitting the needs that I, that I wanted to have in terms of um, the pieces that were missing for stateful applications. Um, but there are some gotchas, right? There's some work to do, some things that uh, we haven't been able to, to run through. So things like, like shard allocation and zone allocation. So I mentioned we're distributing this across the zones, um, but um, it doesn't have, we have to tell Elastic how to do that properly. Um, so things like the Elastic cluster status, we don't have implemented yet. And that will help us enable basically rolling restarts and upgrades. Cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, the Kong operator. <clears throat> so there's a second operator that we've written um, based around the Kong open source API gateway. So this open source gateway um, is used to basically we can isolate traffic within our applications. And the, the problem we wanted to solve was we wanted to be able to en enable HMAC authentication for clients. Um, so here's a picture of kind of what we would do typically, and this may be familiar to some people as well. So at the top, we have our client, which is going to send traffic into our cluster, um, and we have three APIs. And each one of those APIs is going to implement authentication and logging and rate limiting and all those different features. And the problem here is that each team is spending time building these things out, validating these, these things. Um, they have to patch them if things go wrong. Um, they may be different stacks. One may be Ruby, one may be Java. Um, and again, if there's a vulnerability, you may fix one and not the other. And it's just hard to manage sometimes. We want to get to a world that looks like this, right? So at the bottom, the teams don't have to deal with all those things in the middle box. So basically, all traffic is going to route from the, from the client through the Kong API gateway. And then that thing's going to do the, the logging and authentication, all those kind of bits. So this way, our teams are freed up to not have to worry about all this, those things that are repeatable. Um, and they can focus on just building their application. And the only thing they have to do, basically, is read some headers that come off of Kong to know who a user is and what group they're in, that sort of thing. Um, so here we have greatly simplified kind of the, the developer experience. Um, so right now, this, this is still using th third-party resources because we're still on a 1.6 cluster. Um, but you can sort configuration, basically, as that YAML file still, um, which means we can check that in a source and we can code review it. Kong uses... Um, to, to program Kong, you, it's, an, it's a RESTful API. So you can't check a RESTful API into source. It's just unless you wrote some bash, which would be kind of weird. Um, so that's kind of why we wrote this operator. So now we can describe you know, the, the services, which service to turn on which plugin, and what the upstreams match to in the cluster. Describe that in YAML, and then we can write that to the cluster, and then magically Kong spins up and auto configures itself. Um, so here's what this might look like. So here we have. Um, two namespaces, right? And say each namespace is an application. So namespace A is application one, namespace B is application two. Um, you'll see that we've deployed a Kong pod in every namespace. The idea is that traffic, again, will hit Kong, and then it'll authenticate, and then it'll get passed to the application. The problem we've now introduced, though, by doing this model is that nothing stops pod one from talking to pod two. And by doing that now, they've circumvented authentication and logging and all those sort of things which we wanted to implement centrally. 
So we don't want to do that. What we want to do is enforce that we have traffic route from the application pod through Kong again. So now an application talking to another application is going to be enforced is going to be forced to go through those same authentication mechanisms that we've, that we've implemented. And how we can enforce this are things called network policies. So network policies were implemented, implemented by a policy controller. And that controller will write things to IP tables to enforce them behind the scenes. Um, but what you have to do is you create label queries. You say, hey, only you know, an application will only accept requests from maybe a label of type Kong. And that will make sure that it, only Kong pods will be able to talk to applications. Um, so I won't go into great detail of how network policies work. Um, basically, you can limit the traffic you can, you can send around your, your, your cluster. Um, and in 1.8 now, you can also limit your egress traffic. So traffic that leaves the cluster, you can also um, set network policies around that as well. So I must have talked really fast, because I spun right through that really quickly. So this is the end of my slide. So again, I'm Steve Sloka. I work for Heptio now We're, as a customer success engineer. Um, I hope this was helpful and beneficial. Uh, if you have any questions, I can help answer those now. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the question was. How long ago did we build this, and what would we do differently now, now that we kind of know what's going on? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the, the service stuff, and like, like Istio and those sort of things are interesting, um, because the problem is having the full TLS between services. We end up writing a lot of self-signed certs, and we pass these certs all around, and it just becomes a mess, because it's just hard to manage. Um, we've looked at doing things like using, say, Vault for, um, for TLS management to manage, like become our own central CA, um, but that we just never did, because now we've got to manage another layer of, of, um, of storage across zones. Um, but yeah, I think something like, like a mesh would be helpful, because now you can turn on, um, turn on TLS between all the pipes, and then also you know, enhance network policies in the sense of, like the demo today with, with Tigera, it was like, hey, yeah, let's, let's put policies on every single pod, and then we can manage the traffic, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that's what I would, I would do. I just don't think Istio is there yet in terms of um, being production ready. So. Uh, I think it's coming. I think it's neat, but I don't know that we could go go there tomorrow if we could. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything needs to be encrypted. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was that if you use, if you use Istio, you're going to have a sidecar in, next to your pod, yeah. and then basically traffic's going to route over like local host. Yeah. Should it be encrypted um, I don't know the, the HIPAA answer to that, I guess. I think it never leaves, never leaves the, the network namespace of the pod, so it should be OK. Um, but I, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, we're not using Hiptio or, or Istio, so um, all of our traffic basically hits, it's always T TLS as it is because we don't have the option right today. So something to check into, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, this, this guy was saying that you know, it should be OK because you're not going over the wire, so uh, things aren't going to route. Yeah. And a lot of this, too, like, nothing in AWS stops you from using a non-compliant service. Just your own, your own legality does that. You know? So they don't like, my console doesn't look smaller, have less things. It's all still there. It's just up to you to make sure you don't, don't do the wrong thing, I guess, which is kind of cool but kind of scary. Um, and it's always changing. That's why it's nice having the AWS beside, on your side. Because every every day, every month, there's always something new that comes out that wasn't compliant that now is, you know. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, in this example, yes, we are. Yeah. And each Kong is, so each team manages their own Kong implementation. So they're kind of in charge of, here's my Kong and then here's my upstream APIs. Um, Right, yeah, so the question was, where do we de this, you know, deploy this YAML? So we deploy you know, a Kong pod per, per namespace, um, and they're not sidecars, they're just, they're just separate services, yeah. So the, <laughs> right, yeah, in this, yeah, we were thinking about having you know, one Kong namespace and then writing network policies out from there, but it just kind of got tricky and, our initial version was let's keep it simple still and deploy it this way and just bite the overhead of Kong, which is just basically Nginx, if you're not familiar with Kong. It's just running another Nginx ingress kind of um, pod, so it's not really a high, high overhead, I guess, yeah. Yes? No. No, we just, I don't know if we had a specific, specific version of that, yeah. No, I'm not sure. So yeah, the question is, is that there's things in Google that you're using that's not HIPAA compliant yet, but you want to, it is encrypted. Um, I think you'd have to check with Google on that to see if, if you'd be in a legal issue. Um, I think, I mean, you, again, you can do whatever you want, I think. There's nothing stopping you, but it's a matter of if you had a data breach, I think Google's going to say, hey, that's not our job, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's compliant. Yeah, so yeah, th that is still compliant. It's just, I guess, the matter of if there's a legal issue or not that you want to deal with. But um, because if Google's not certifying that as HIPAA compliant, then then they're not going to help you out if there's a legal problem with a, if there is a breach. But you are doing the right things. You know what I mean? Like I could store data. I don't know what a service like um, like API Gateway isn't is a service in AWS that it's compliant, but caching is not. Um, so I guess if I stored cached PHI in that API gateway, that sounds weird, I know, but I think they still wouldn't help me if I had a breach because they said that's not compliant, so you shouldn't do that. Um, but, you, but you are doing the right things in terms of encrypting data, for sure. Yeah, you would be compliant, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool, yeah. Yes. Um, sort of not really. So we have like FluentD running everywhere, and we typically just write standard out to make that simpler. Um, so so we like append the, the the header of the log with something like HIPAA or some some unique value, and then we can put a filter on that. Um, and then we can you know when that um, FluentD picks up that those records, they can dump them to an S3 bucket somewhere. Um, that's yeah. We also had one team. So we have lots of teams doing it all different ways, which is probably not not weird, but. Um, one team wrote like a little sidecar to dump it to S3, so they just write to like a, a place on disk. And that was just because they were running on-prem and they were writing to like an NFS share and then we switched to the cloud and, and S3 was the right place for that. So um, that's the best thing we've come up so far, yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it's always hard, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, and then, it, yeah, it becomes an issue, yeah. So way in the back. I'm sorry, what was the key repeat? So, uh, HIPAA heightens standards uh, for my understanding they require like um, anti malware uh, antivirus needs to be running on post pad So I'm not sure how that works out for ECP uh, the scribbles is on the uh, how they comply with that specific part. Uh, so so the question was that HIPAA compliance has to have antivirus running um, on all the nodes. Um, well I guess we don't. I, I guess 
So we're running CoreOS, yeah. Because from our Okay. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I know. I know. We, so, so we had lots of people in our environment wanting to run security scans and all these things, and then they find out they're running on CoreOS, and then it's just they don't deploy because there's no agent. You can't install anything. Um, so yeah, we don't have anything like that, at least on our, our, our Kubernetes infrastructure. I know on the Windows machine, there are a few Windows instances that people run that may have those on there, but um, yeah. Yeah, there's a trade-off. It's kind of like... Okay, yeah, so the, just saying, yeah, it's, it, that's, that's okay, yeah. So, I, but double check, don't, don't make me... <laughs> so Steve said that you could do it, you know. Um, <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was compliance around the, the images we're building and the binaries and those sort of things. Um, we don't have any rules around it. I know we're looking at using, um, like, uh, I think we're implementing TwistLock with one of our other solutions on, these, on the on-prem systems. Um, and that will help us do um, image scanning in terms of vulnerabilities in the images. Um, and we're, I was also looking at things on the open source side of, of uh, Claire from CoreOS will do scanning, and that's a free open source thing. And there's a thing called Kate. And Kate will basically, when a new pod spins up, it'll scan it with Claire on the fly. So you may scan an image up front, and then if, you know, next day there's an vulnerability that comes out. So Kate will basically say, hey, this thing was good yesterday. Now it just spun up. So there's, there's you know, things, issues with it. Um, we didn't actually imp implement any of that yet. Um, but yeah, those are things that I would do, I guess. So those are regulations and compliance that we're just extra things Yeah, no, so it's, it's goofy. I mean, HIPAA compliant, it's not like rule cut and dry. It's just the better you make your networks and the, the more secure you are. So all the best practices come into play. So the, I think the, it's, it's great. It's the, the less vulnerabilities you have, the less room for error you're going to have. So I think it's always a good thing to do um, that way. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. So the question was, were network policies enough to, to satisfy our, our compliance? Um, I think they were, at, at, at least the last time we, we did this. Um, we typically deployed an environment per, per, or an AWS account per application or per team, so, um, which is, seems very small. So we didn't have big multi-tenant clusters where we had to deal with lots of lots of, lots of different applications. So um, yeah, those, those were enough, I think, to satisfy, satisfy our folks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, how do we deal with incidents response? So say we get compromised, what do we do with that? Um, and so we have a whole cloud kind of team that manages these environments. Um, and at UPMC, they have a big split between development and, and deployment, so engineers can't access production. So at least they're off the hook in terms of, of, of working with that. Um, I know they have ticketing systems, and, and um, the architecture has those bastion boxes. So again, if, if we had some compromise, we can turn off those bastion boxes and basically isolate ourselves. Um, but yeah. So if I could figure out what container, yeah. So if I could figure out what the container was, I would just remove those labels from it, so it would come out of the deployment. And it would still stay running, but and, and Cube will spin up a new a new version of that pod, and, it'll, and this will still stay there sitting. Um, in the cloud environments, we don't have any any um, local data. They're all I guess we mounted via EBS volumes if we had that. Um, that's how we would isolate that. Yeah. Um, so and most of our data stores in the public cloud, sort of Elastic, are all AWS managed services. So things like Aurora we use, and Elasticache, and um, the the queuing thing. So they're all things outside of our our control or our, our use that we can we can talk to, yeah. Anybody else have questions? We're out of time, so hey thank you again. Appreciate it.